Hello, um, everyone, um, to the world listening. Um, hi, I'm Mike Boyle. Um, I'm the voice you can hear. I'm the program leader for film, TV, and theatre production at the Norman School of Arts. Um, I'm delighted to have former student Tom Marshall, a writer, a producer, and director who is one of the directors on the brand new Netflix blockbuster comedy series, um, starting on 29th of May, uh, Space Force, starring Stephen Carell, John Malkovich, amongst others, um, who are huge, it's a huge production. So, uh, Tom, hello, and welcome back hello. to Northern School of Art. <laughs> it's <laughs> <Yeah>. me here. <laughs> uh, weird, isn't it, Tom? Yeah, um, very so weird. So, to start off, can I ask you um, about your early career? When you know, so we you, you were here from two thousand and five to two thousand and seven. So, what happened yeah. in your early journey? Yeah, well, so I think even before CCAD, I did like media studies at art college, right? because I thought it would be a bit of a dos. I remember thinking, oh yeah, <laughs> talking about films and that. Yeah, I sort of like films. Um, but then just found myself really enjoying the process of making stuff to the point that I remember I started doing all my mates, all my mates were sort of burnout, sort of stoner types. <laughs> <laughs> I started like doing all their coursework for them. I started wow. shooting their films for them because I enjoyed it so much and I enjoyed the editing and stuff. I'd always been creative. I remember when I was a kid, I was always writing. So I guess it's just with media studies, I sort of felt like I found it quite a cool outlet. Um, and then there was sort of no contest really in terms of what I was going to carry for, on further into university because I wasn't good at anything else basically. <laughs> <laughs> so then yeah, I saw the art college advert and then the big thing for me was that Ridley Scott went there. I was, I was always saying that to people, Ridley Scott went there, Ridley Scott went there. Um, and then just making stuff all the time, I guess is what it was. And then I guess I was always eyeing up competitions was my big thing, like with cash prizes in particular. <laughs> and there was one, the BBC New Talent Award it was called, and if you got shortlisted, um, you went down to a bit of an award ceremony. If you won, you got a cash prize of £5,000 and it went out on BBC Three, which at the time it was like Natural Channel. Um, and that for me, five grand at the time, was like, <laughs> what? Balling. So I remember the first time I made an attempt, didn't even get shortlisted. Um, the second time um, I got shortlisted with a drama called Daddy's Girl. Um, and we went down to Bristol uh, for the New Encounters Festival. And we didn't win. What was quite important that happened is it, the short was a drama, but played alongside some comedies. And I remember just being really jealous of the people's <laughs> shorts who was get, were getting laughs and things. And I thought, God, that'll be good. So I thought, right, next year I'll try a comedy. And then the big seminal thing that happened, right, there was an actress called Jo Hartley who had done a couple of Shane Meadows films at the time. This is England in Dead Man's Shoes. And I was the biggest diehard <laughs> Shane Meadows fan. And by sheer coincidence, right, I was at Stockton, Teesside Park, and she was doing promotions for a new Marks and Spencers. And she like handed me this flyer Marks and Spencers. No. And I was like, oh my God, you're out with Dead Man's Shoes in this thing. <laughs> it's like I'd proper met a superstar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I said, let, let me get your email address and I, I do short films and we'll do a short film together. So then I had her in the bag. So then I sort of was trying to think of ideas all the time, this BBC Awards um, with Joe Hartley. And, and what I ended up writing was um, a script called Big Boy 74, <laughs> which was about the dudes going to kill himself on the moors, but then he's mistaken for someone, Joe Hartley's character has arranged to meet over the internet for like casual sex. So it's a sort of comedy film about suicide and dogging. And um, we made it for about 300 quid. Um, I wrote my brother in who did filming and he helped us out with the filming. Um, and then, yeah, that, that won, that won the awards, um, went out on BBC Three before Doctor Who. And then that really, everything that's happened you can sort of backtrack to that one little short film I did. Because what's funny is even Chewing Gum, right, which again in terms of the stepping stones was like a big step up that did quite well on Netflix, it got the BAFTA nomination stuff from Michaela Cole, won the BAFTA and thing. Mm -hmm. um, but even that, by that point I'd actually done some TV, yeah. I'd done London Irish, I'd done Grifters and things like that. But I remember Michaela, the writer, creator and star, They'd obviously like met loads of directors, have been sent loads of work, 
And when she met me, said, oh, you did the Doggin film. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So inadvertently, I even chewing gum I got because of this twatty little the shot tiny, film I did. Three quid like film. 300 quid yeah, film, you really? know. Yeah. So what was it like working for the first time then in TV, like on a, on a big kind of, you know, uh, terrestrial TV yeah. show? Oh, well, I was, again, dead, dead lucky because at the time, and please, students should check to see if this is still going, I did a scheme called Coming Up for Channel 4, right? Yeah, yeah, I remember. Which is a scheme almost specifically to get new writers, new directors a chance at doing some telly. Um, little half hour dramas, standalone dramas, new writer, new director. And again, in terms of the stepping stones thing, because I think it's all, that's what it all is. You don't do one thing, or I think it's rare that you do one thing, then all of a sudden you're catapulted. It's all little stepping stones and chess pieces. So Big Boy had sort of led to me getting some Northern Film Media funding um, and I did this shot Happy Clapper with like a 20 grand budget, which yeah, to me, was great. Oh, which, that, that was, was like... That was the one in the caravan. Yeah, yeah I love exactly. That so to me, that was like, I made it a 20 grand budget. Um, but because of that, then I got sort of onto the coming up scheme. Um, and that, almost because it's for new writers, directors, it's all quite a nurturing environment. All the producers have obviously been like briefed that it's all new writers and directors and you've got to like, shepherd them through. So my first ever bit of telly for Channel 4, the little half-hour drama, was like just a lovely, warming, beautiful experience <laughs> with all these lovely producers around me, like helping me through and whenever I got all this stuff, they'd help me through. In contrast, right, <laughs> because I did that, I then almost immediately after got a chance to do three one-hour um, comedy dramas for ITV2. Right? Switch. Called Switch, right? Uh, and it was like special effects heavy, sort of lots of characters, very complicated stuff. Certainly at that point in my career, it all felt very complicated. So then all of a sudden, after doing this lovely little one, one half hour drama, I was just shot into doing like a proper bit of telly mm. with like proper producers, proper actors. And oh man, the contrast. Like I remember filming, I would literally get like twisting knots in my <laughs> stomach because it was so, so stressful and like ulcers on my mouth because it was just so stressful. And so how did you prep for that then? Like, especially visual effects, because we have a visual effects and model making. Yeah. So, so how do you do, how do you work with all the different departments when it suddenly goes from, yeah, small little 20 grand film to... Oh, to, it was mental. And what was mental is what I didn't realise at the time is even by the standards I'm used to now, the switch I had no time to do oh, anything right. and the scripts kept changing literally last minute mm. literally last minute so I, I was prepping loads and all nervous and that was doing my little shot list and doing little storyboards but then not knowing the way tv works everything changed last minute so all the prep i'd done was useless yeah <laughs> so also even when i was filming then with a the proper crew and two cameras and all the toys and the cranes and the dollies and stuff it all just came down to the same instinct of like the little student filmmaking days and just like going with your instinct and just sort of editing as mm -hmm. I went in my head, like, right, I've got a shot here and now I need a shot there. But yeah, I think like, you know, there was there was difficulty with the cast. I think the cast sort of clicked on that I was quite wet behind the ears yeah. and like would challenge me on stuff <coughs> and I wasn't used to that. And um, the producers were really standoffish and just sort of left me to it. So that's um, that little lovely gorgeous bubble. Had gone all of a sudden, then, yeah. Now you're a proper director. You yeah, um, and then even the second job I did, right? London Irish, that was again difficult in its own ways. Big massive step up now, suddenly it was like a Channel 4, quite high end mm -hmm. comedy. Yeah. Lisa McGee, quite a, a very celebrated writer. And then that was hard because it was like, sort of some very outspoken producers on it. And that was a polar opposite to Switch, whereas yeah, literally yeah. we're at the monitors at all times. So that was sort of the experience of working with like a committee yeah, yeah. of producers and sort of having to run stuff by, by them so, and everything, you know. So just taking a step back with that, with, with, with the writer, did you have much influence on the script or, you know? Not so, not so much with uh, London Irish because like Lisa McGee's you can see now with Derry Mills is yeah. such the author, you know, and this this stuff later on down the line where I was like heavily influencing the scripts and well like now with Fama I write a lot of the stuff. Yeah, yeah. Whereas like London Irish was a lesson in like it was totally Lisa's world and totally her voice. Yeah. 
so you sort of more had to tune into that and if anything consult her stuff and ask her questions a lot of the time you know and respect right. that well, that's, nice, that's nice that that writer's got that power because i know oh. our script writers they always worry the director's going to take over everything and, and oh, yeah. like that. but that's uh, there's a, a case and scenario where there's the writer does hold like quite a bit of power oh, as yeah. far as their own creation that's good to say oh completely it, yeah. with with writer the tv's writer leg for me yeah and it's only like the odd job which we'll talk about like you know the wasted the family lambs the world where i've really got to flex the muscles and sort of do what i want and really play about a bit a lot of it you, it's a lot about like respecting the writer's vision more so than film i think you yeah. know um, I was going to, one of my things, I can probably mention it now as we're talking about writers and things. Obviously, Family, very successful, BBC Three again. Isn't yeah. it? You're the sole writer, is that right? Or? I, I write a good chunk of it. Like, so, so I write half of it and then we get other writers in and then the producer, uh, aka, writes a big chunk of it. So that's kind of like ideal for most people to write and direct their own oh, work. Yeah. work. So and it's sort of a rarity. That, it is a rarity, yeah, yeah. Oh, that is, that, of all the jobs I've done, that's my favourite job and if anyone gets a chance to check it out please even just look at some little clips online because that is it's a dream job for a director and, and a writer director because you literally like it, I, it, I write sketches in terms of right what genre do I want to do oh it'd be good to do it like a superhero thing right I'll think of a sketch to <laughs> you know to get away with doing a fight scene and some sexy superhero visuals you know yeah um and it is and in terms of like a, a, bit, a bit of a training um ground it's perfect for like i can think of a couple of examples where like um we are you, you try and shoot four sketches in a day right? Oh, right okay um and i can think of an example where we were in a church and we'd shot like three of the sketches but the fourth sketch we remember to do was shoot was really elaborate and with, there wasn't a chance in hell we were going to do it in the day so me and the producer were like sat there right what can we film in an hour and we literally wrote a sketch that we could film in an hour wow. to film in the last hour <laughs> during the lunch. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So there's all sexy stuff like that. But again, it's all happened back to like when you'd be messing about in college and just doing daft short films for the fun of it and just thinking on your toes, you know. Um, but yeah, it's the absolute dream. My technology is going mad. We still have it. <laughs> so it's hard for me to rejoin. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Oh, uh, thank God for that. Right, okay, okay. Yeah, so I was just wanted to see if there's any questions. Uh, oh, what did you do after finishing art school and what was it like? Yeah. So, yeah, immediately after art school, right, um, it was like corporates and things, sort of like really low fi corporates and wind videos. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. So, this is a, like, I think it's good for students to know, like, expect a bit of that, like, you just have to pay your way and pay the rent and you'll end up doing stuff that you know it's all character building and yeah you know before netflix i was literally doing when videos like i just we had a company we like actually had a short student who got wedding photographer um best wedding photographer in, in the world or something oh yeah it's, it's, it's a, a lucrative his films, his films look like cinematography yeah beautifully shot i mean lately way better people are using drones them. now they're using little steady cams little yeah, gimbals yeah. and stuff um, so mine was a much more lo-fi version of that. So yeah, there was a, a, a chunk of time immediately after art college and uni where it was like just paying the bills and just, you know, I had a camera, I had a Z1 camera in my file cut software and I was just like putting myself around to do anything. I think that's the, the thing, isn't it? You, you really pushed to find work, you went for competitions, yeah. you, went, you didn't stop. I think that is a real kind of good lesson for students. Yeah. You've got to keep looking for work. You've got to keep, you know, you, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to take somewhere off. Or yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. You know, everyone's like yourself is pushing and pushing for the work. I um, think it's good. Like, like basically, I avoided what I did avoid by doing that is having to work in Tesco's or whatever. Yeah. So it was always like, even the day job, me after uni was like, I was a filmmaker and call myself, but you know, I was doing yeah, like yeah. corporates and um, stuff like that. So this kind of goes back to actually what we're talking about the writers. Uh, and back to Family Lamb. Um, how does directing episodes of a series with its own overall style different from an individual film? Is it hard to put your own style into something like that? So I think that's what yeah. we say. You've got, you've got the writer for yeah. uh, London Irish. That's very much her world. Yeah. How much influence can you put in that? It, 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 the thing with TV, it varies from job to job. You know, and there's certain jobs like, yeah, the London Irish in the world where it's like very much you can just hear the writer's voice and everything and you can 
there's no point fighting against it. It's her world, just serve that material. Mm. And it's dialogue heavy and it's all about the dialogue and the way the characters speak and the way the lines are delivered. So just serve that. So don't do anything too fancy <laughs> and just plonk the camera down. Make sure you get the gags, make sure you get the jokes, make, make sure you get the lines right. But then in contrast, I did a show called Wasted with oh, Sean Bean yeah, yeah, and things. Yeah. So that, and I'm really close to the writers even to this day. And before we'd even started filming, there was loads of discussion with the writers about how they wanted it to, it to look and how they completely wanted to embrace, you know, sort of little homage moments, parody moments, little visual flourishes, you know, like that. So I knew on that, I was like, right, okay, here we go. We're going to get a flex a bit of muscles on here. We're going to have some fun and do some stuff, you know. So it's almost like you've got to vary it from job to job. But then, in, and that's the UK jobs. Mm. In contrast to that, there would be the American jobs I've done where you do sort of block shooting where across the series there can be like four or five directors okay and you've sort of always i think it's madness to try and you know make it vary too much from episode to episode i think if, you, if people watching stuff and suddenly one episode looks totally different to another it'll take them out of it so i think that's why there's that thing is formed of sort of ad adhering to one style and in space force for example paul king who did paddington films was directing the first episode and Therefore, he sort of set the look. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, there's an element where you've got to stay within certain parameters. But luckily, because he's Paul King, he's a genius. It's amazing. <laughs> it worked in suit the show, so it never felt like that much of a compromise to have to sort of follow these rules. And then within that, you get to play about a bit and you get to do visual flourishes. You yeah. know, like for instance, I did episodes two and three of Space Force, and um, when I came on, I remember on my first day out, I, I knew they had a run in. That you can get quite sexy 360 tracks and shots <laughs> over the table and stuff. And I said to the the man who operated, Oh, should we get the Ronin out? And his face lit up, <laughs> literally like, like, really? And I was like, Yeah, man, let's get it out. We've got a shot we can do over the table. That looked nice. And Paul basically hadn't got the Ronin out for his block. Yeah. And the Ronin guy operated like all over it and he was loving the chance to run around and play about and the stuff looked really nice and sort of suited the style. You know, it's slightly different from what had been set. I was going to say, one, did, still did, you shoot, did you shoot it safe in case they turned around, the producers turned around and said, no, we're not having that Roman stuff, that wasn't what Paul said in the first episode? No, 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 I, for that, I just went with it. Right. Like, for, for instance, like this would be the one thing. So I had an episode where um, it's all quite a bottleneck episode. It's all set in a stock control room. Mm. Steve Carell is talking to a chimp in space, basically trying, to, <laughs> trying to get a chimp to fix a satellite, right? Um, but because it's a bit of a bottleneck episode and it's all in one location, I wanted to mix it up a bit, right? So the style that we adopted for the Space Force is quite almost Wes Anderson like oh, okay. big wides and things, quite strategically placed, and it's all smooth, dolly moves and things like that. I wanted to do at least one scene once the tension had started racking up a bit in the episode to go handheld and fight against it and have a bit messy and and um, Greg Daniels, the creator, was just like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> because he did the American office and he was, you know, for whatever reasons, really wanted to fight against that. And he didn't want any comparison with the, the look of the office. So I think he heard handheld and he was like, oh, it's going to look like the office. Yeah, I don't want that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for instance, like once in a while, yeah, you do get pushed back. Yeah, yeah. But often you just get away with it and you can. You cool. can... Um, so you, you just remind me, um, when you mentioned about the office and stuff like that, if, who is the person you've been so more, most proud of to work with and stuff like that? Who, who was the person who went, oh God, I've made it, I'm working with so-and-so? Yeah, that. well, look, Steve Carell was obviously amazing. Um, but before that was Sean Bean. <laughs> <laughs> that was sort of wicked. Yeah. That, that was, was wicked, wasted, right? wasn't it? That was unwasted, I've right? got an image of you. You sent it to me yeah. about two or three years ago. Yeah. And I did my publicity and you mentioned earlier on about uh, well, I should Ridley tell you. Scott. Uh, and I've got a picture of former former students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a picture of you with Sean Bean and there's a picture of Ridley Scott, I think, from the BAFTAs when oh, he really talked, talked about uh, <laughs> the art college. So, yeah, so yeah, you're, you're heavily featured. Now people say, not only did Ridley Scott here, hopefully Tom Marshall. Oh, well, yeah. Imagine. <laughs> but even that that picture, though, is sort of fake. Oh, because yeah. that, by that point, I got quite pally yeah. with Sean. Yeah. And at the time I was single and I'd been telling him that I'd been on Tinder quite a bit. <laughs> and the on-set photographer was around and I was like, Sean, it was like in between a tape, I was like, Sean, let me just get a photo with me pointing and you looking as if I'm saying something good. 
And he said, oh, is it for your Tinder? No, it is. <laughs> so now I had that, for a bit, I had this wicked thought on Tinder and me with Sean Bean. But <laughs> even that, it's like... Very, it's very successful. It looks very So easy. what was interesting with the Sean Bean thing, right? So the lads, the writers, James Lamont and John Foster, had wrote Sean Bean in the script before we got him. Sean Bean basically plays one of the main characters, spirit guides. Yes, that's right. He yeah. transports to, you know, it's a re very real character having girl problems, whatever, and then he transports to a magical forest with Sean Bean in full Game of Thrones garb and gives him advice on pulling women, basically, that's the joke. But before we got Sean Bean in the script, it said Sean Bean, yeah. and we didn't really have a contingency. Yeah. So there was this amazing moment where, like, we just got, we were watching as the casting director was on the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put the phone down, we've got Sean Bean. Brilliant. And I remember, like, literally jumping up into the writer's arms and hugging him. We've got Sean Bean! <laughs> but there was no rehearsal, right? And he just was coming on the day, the first day of his filming, he was just going to be there. I'd never met him before. Yeah. And it was first thing in the morning, it was like six o'clock in the morning. I was super tired. I hadn't had my tea or coffee yet. And then one of the ADs, one of the assistant directors said, oh, Sean, so you should go and meet Sean, say hello to him. I was like, all right, yeah. I'm not thinking at the time it was Sean Bean. And I walked into the makeup trailer and he was there. And I literally said, Sean Bean. <laughs> yeah, there you are. Oh, Tom, nice to meet you. And what's interesting, immediately he had a question for me before we spoke anything um, about the scene he was about to shoot. Said, oh, Tom, this scene we're about to shoot, how do you want me to do this bit here? So not only had I just met Sean, I mean, suddenly I actually had him asking me a genuine yeah, question yeah, about rhetoric. Oh, was like, oh, was needed, yeah. But luckily, like the, the question I sort of knew the answer to because the joke was he was he was giving the main character advice on on getting to the home after a night house and, and he was sort of treating it like a quest. So the, the monologue that Sean was doing, you know, even though it was sort of about just getting home so you can get over your hangover, the joke was clearly that he needed to deliver it in a way that it was like he was in Lord of the Rings and he was talking about the most epic quest ever. So luckily I had that sort of prepped and ready now, you know, he put me on the spot, I told him that. And then he said, all oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you want me to do it like this? And Sean Bean literally grabbed me by my shoulder and we, it was an inch away from my face and giving me this big epic, you know, monologue. Yeah. And then at the end of it, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah do it like that. Do it like that. <laughs> and then I went over to the writers. I like, you won't believe what just happened to me. <laughs> so that was quite interesting. I think there's sort of a lesson there in that even though I was like starstruck and he's like Sean Bean, he's done all these films. He'd never done comedy before. So yeah, yeah. he yeah. he, he fell out worried, of his yeah. depth and he yeah. was worried and he had a genuine question for me and I had a genuine answer. If you so, know I mean. so that's, um, again, we, uh, since you've um, um, been away, we've now got an acting course. Yeah. yeah. And so one of the advantages of the acting program here is that they do stage and screen work. Yeah. Um, so um, hopefully for, for the actors, they're now in their second year, we'll be the first third year next yeah. year. Um, but they, do work with the film TV students and stuff, and, and they work on acting. How how long as a director do you get with these actors? You know, on, on TV shows, do you get to rehearse? Yeah. I mean, you're saying there, Sean Bean just turns up on the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, but yeah, yeah. what about for the rest of the, the normal productions? Yeah, normal productions, and let's say like not the higher level tier actors. Yeah. Generally, you get a good week oh, or so cool. before, right, which cool. is good. But again, this is what I go just going back to switch. That's another reason. I was shot in the deep end quite a bit because I didn't get any rehearsal time. And you do realise, or certainly I've learned that rehearsal time is so, so valuable. It's like gold dust with TV. Um, and obviously for all the performance reasons, and that's the one and only time you just get to have the script in front of you. There's no trucks parked up. There's no pressure. You know, there's no time constraints. You can spend all day long just going over the script, going over the gags trying stuff out and it's literally the only time you get to do it. If you think you're going to have time to do that on set and TV, you're kidding yourself, right? But a lesson I learned on London Irish, which was so fundamental, and I, I just to pass it on now, like do your blocking mm. in rehearsal, because again, you don't want to be wasting time on set when you've got trucks parked up and people and gaffers are stood around waiting for waiting to work, blocking stuff out and figuring stuff out there. So what I learned in London Irish, like, by that point, you've done your recce, so you know what your locations are like. In the rehearsal room, say, there's a chair, the door's here. Um, so yeah, what do you what do you think about coming in here and sitting down there um, and eyeing it all out there, right? Because what will happen, I think, 
with a lot of actors, because obviously like there's ego and stuff, and that has happened to me and I had to learn to deal with. If you're blocking on set for the first time, there'll be discussion. And if you say, oh, why don't you come to the store and sit there? The, you know, five times out of 10, they'll, they'll say, no, no, I think I should go over here. And then you've got a plan, <laughs> your plan's out the window. Yeah, yeah. So the time to do all that is rehearsal, yeah. you know, and I even like, I have my iPhone out and I'll block it out and I'll get them to do it. And I literally get my shots there. Awesome. Yeah. Bang, bang, I want a shot there, I want a shot there. And then when I do need a storyboard, I don't storyboard, I take a screen grab of the shot and I literally start. So then I literally have my shot list there and I just show the DOP, I want that, 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 that. Cool. And, and so you've already blocked out your camera positions as well by doing that. Exactly. Yeah. And, cool. and it's so funny because it's funny how much doing it that way, for me anyway, I know obviously everyone has their own methods. For me, it literally is ingrained. I don't need to look at the material then. If I, and often, like, I'll be on the car on the way to set, and I don't even have to look at the list. I can literally just watch the video of the blocking, and I'll do the shots in the video. I'll be doing the shots for me. Cool. And then it's just in my head. I've visually got it then. And then you just, you look as if you're going on instinct all day. So, so, yeah, so, so, so would you, uh, if you've pre-done that, would you then send the shots or whatever to the DOP and say, oh, this is the look I'm going for? Yeah, so like with Space Force yeah. and stuff, I didn't actually have time with Steve because he's Steve Carell and he was like, you shooting the first episode. But I had his stand-ins. So I, what I did is I nicked his stand-in, who right, was yeah. Steve Carell look-alike. Yeah, yeah. And then I had the set, when I had the set to myself, I'd get my shots for Steve. And then I had a little storyboard with my fake Steve and yeah, I would send them and how, how, how much time did you have to prepare for for doing your shots before Steve Carell walks on the set, for example? Well, like, it's a tight... So to talk about Space Force, it, once you get in the American thing, it is a tight turnaround. So I filmed, prepped and filmed two episodes of Space Force in a month. Right. So two weeks prep, two weeks filming. Um, and, like, I had the luxury there, like, the sets were built. And that is amazing. Like you don't, it's not even like you have to fake it. Then you can be on set, yeah. and you can just take it all in, and then yeah, you can really map it out, and um, it's a big help. So, so I'm assuming for for um, space, no, of course, it, it's visual effects and all sorts going on. Have you got to consider that? Or? But yeah, but at that level, I mean, it is crazy. Like I, you had a visual visual effects guy with you all day. Oh right, okay. And um, just to tell you a little story, like just about the levels that in TV now it is mental. You're basically doing feature film stuff for TV now. Uh, for me, I think Netflix, the streamers, they're the new feature film, right? So my first day on prep for Space Force, right? Um, I meet the line producer and she says to me, uh, we need to talk about the chimp. That was one, literally one of the first <laughs> ones because in one of my episodes, there was a chimp in space. Steve, uh, for a big bulk of the episode, Steve Carell is trying to get a chimp in space to fix a satellite, right? That's the episode. And I've obviously been reading it. I was like, what are we going to do there? And I, in my head, thought, right, it's going to be a really good chimp suit. You know, you get those really good yeah. chimps. And um, the line producer said to me, we need to talk about the chimp. And I, for a joke, said, oh, are we going to get Andy Serkis in to do motion capture? Oh, yeah, sure. For a joke. Yeah. And she said, no, 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 but we've been talking to his company. The quote's about a million dollars. And I laughed. I was like, oh, right, yeah. <laughs> but, he, but that's what we've ended up doing. The chimp is done by Weta, who do Planet of the Apes. Um, and he's sort of, it's funny because he is actually a chimp that already designed. So we inadvertently have a bit of a cameo from one of the chimps in Planet of the Apes in, in Space Force. Uh, so yeah, for that, I literally had the VFX guy with me at all times. And and, and that was that, so I am just thinking about the blocking because we, we, funny enough, we've got some students um, annoyingly because of coronavirus, they haven't quite finished their final um, yeah. major project, but it's set in space and they built spaceship work yeah, yeah. for production design, so they've got a spaceship built, it's sat in the for a minute and I hope to finish off the film, but so much time and effort was done yeah. planning when they oh, put yeah. our screens and stuff like that, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but they, as students, have got quite a lot of time, Yeah, but, yeah. so your visual effects guy, would he be literally saying like, no, Tom, you can't do that, yeah, yeah there was a bit of that, <laughs> and yeah, it was, it's quite tricky because there's a huge control room where the episode is basically set. And obviously all the stuff that Steve Carell is looking at wasn't actually done yet. So there was quite a lot of that <laughs> chat going on. But in terms of the actual chimp, I literally, I just had an amazing storyboard artist. I guess at that level, like you do, you just get amazing professionals in. And yeah, yeah. we had a couple of sit downs and I just described to him, acted out what I think, what I thought the chimp should be doing at any given moment. <laughs> 
And then, yeah, I just got these amazing storyboards through. Cool. And then a couple of times on the big monitor in the launch site, we did have storyboards playing in for Steve to react to, so he knew what the, he knew what the chip was going to be doing. Right, cool, yeah. At that time. Um, sorry, so that sound about that sit down as well. Uh, this is one actually my pre prepared questions. I remember to write some questions. Was how do you, especially on a bigger show, maybe yeah. not Space Force because it's so massive, but um, how do you, as the director, work with the different departments? You know, for, for example, I'm just thinking we've got like costume, production yeah. design, acting. Yeah. How do you, as a director, work with different departments to get your vision on the screen? Yeah, just lots, lots of sit downs, lots of meetings. For costume, I figured out because early on in my career, I just to think I have to, I have to sound intelligent. <laughs> so I try and like describe to them and use the tiniest little knowledge of fashion that I knew, and I'd sound like a, I was a dick, but like. <laughs> Now I've figured out I can't and I don't even try to do that. Now when I meet costume people beforehand, I say I want to see lots of pictures and I want to be able to point at things. So many and stuff. Yeah, exactly. They yeah. bring stuff to me and then I point. Oh, yeah, I like that. I like <laughs> that. I like that. You know, um, what's interesting, I did a job for Apple um, and, and one of the big streamers, you know, trying to like battle it out with Netflix at the moment. I did a job for them and I did episode one for that. So a lot of it, I was like setting the look for it, setting the tone for it. And it was all American um, people behind it. Which and this is, this is Ted Lasso. All oh, right, so this hasn't come out yet. This hasn't come out, yeah, so yeah. it's going to come out on Apple soon. It stars Jason Sudeikis of Horrible Bosses fame and We Are The Millers. Uh, he plays an NFL coach who's suddenly in charge of a premiership football. <laughs> so it's a bit of a team, so it's a bit of a fish out of water comedy um, for Apple. And yeah, for them, like just to give your students a little bit of a heads up, like I've never had to do it before. And this was only last year, so even a good few years in the industry, suddenly I had to do this thing that I've never had to do before, where all the execs were in America, and I had to do a huge show and tell, just me, with like, honestly, about 30, 40 people, all like American execs just sat there looking, and go over every department with them. So the design elements, you know, it's all online. yeah, right. this is just like a virus. It's free coronavirus. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was just because they were in LA and I had to do like, yeah, it's sort of via satellite like presentation. You have to go over all the production design, all the costume and makeup choices, um, you know, with the shooting style and just give it like presentation because they wanted to know what was happening, you know. Wow. So obviously beforehand for that, there was all sorts of meetings going on with me trying to school up with the you know, designer with the costume designer, um, exactly what we were going for. So I didn't look stupid in front of the Americans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you've obviously got the job then. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, so how have you found it? Because um, uh, one of the questions actually, talking about the Netflix, Apple, and all that, one of the questions uh, we had from um, Pat was, you know, what do you think about sort of going forward? You know, it, if you know COVID nineteen is here to stay or whatever, or you know at least for a year or so, what do you think the future is going to be for the industry? Um, I'm a bit clueless to it. I can tell you, I've got a job happening in June, apparently. Right? <laughs> it's a BBC little one-off, super short, like fifteen-minute little short film they're doing for the iPlayer, um, with the potential of making a series of it. But the very nature of the idea is a character walks into a bar and tells a story. So you could have the bar quite sparsely populated and there's no actual human interaction on screen. So we're sort of getting that one under the radar yeah, yeah. because it's so small fry, you know. In terms of like me doing Space Force 2 this year, which is what I meant, I, I won't be doing that this year. <laughs> I, nah, well, I will be doing that, you know, hopefully 2021. Yeah. Um, I'd say it's going to have to recalibrate itself. There's new guidelines out. Have you seen the Bet2 guidelines? Yeah. Yeah, mad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. We've been, uh, we've been sharing it online and stuff and going, right, how are we going to do that? Are yeah. You so it's like, um, from an educational point of view, like, you know, we're in this studio now and you're three metres away from me. I'm just thinking for the future, people might go, why, why are they miles yeah. <laughs> well, away? Um, but I, I just keep thinking about like things like EastEnders, they, they're hoping to come back online and stuff. How do you do it? Like a romantic scene now? Exactly. Yeah. Like that. I can just picture lots of scenes where it's like, no, stay away from me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay two meters away from me. I don't <laughs> want to see you again. Yeah. So I just, I think that's a very short term solution to it. Yeah, and I yeah. honestly think, I, I personally feel it will have to get to a point where they have to let us go out and shoot stuff. But 
let us take the risk in doing it. I've, I've it has to be. I've already had a meeting with my uh, my team on film, and we said, right. Well, so the script writers, when they're writing scripts, they're probably going to have to look, lots of outdoor locations, guys, exactly, yeah. uh, just to make it easy. And make yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I did a show um, that I was meant to be doing now. I should, I would have finished it by now. A, a pilot for BBC, and the opening scene was two people having sex in the toilet. Cut to um, crowded comedy club nice and it's just like well, we can't do it and yeah. you know so i see people are gonna have to rewrite for a while be really creative for a bit yeah, yeah. but i think that can only go so long before audiences get super sick of seeing just people, yeah, yeah, people yeah. alone in rooms or on, on walks by themselves you know yeah. i think eventually get a point where we'll just have to there'll yeah. have to be new guidelines and it'll, people take the risk in doing it and going out yeah i, I just imagine that every time on production and um, I was reading um, in Africa, they, they were really ahead of the game. They'd hardly had any deaths and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. But they, they, from January, they, they were um, corona testing just to see if people were fine. Yeah, and yeah. I also watched, uh, uh, what was it, um, hey, sorry, I thought, I think. they've got these tests where you can see if people are um, got temperature. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Like and I can see that for film production. People are like, we'll go in in the morning. Like, yeah, exactly. they're fine. They're fine. Oh, not sure about you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, you have to. Um, so it is an interesting um, yeah. future. But I think creativity at the time. It, it'd be good for a bit, and already I'm enjoying some of the Zoom-based comedies you're seeing. But yeah, yeah, we'll get tired of that pretty sick. I, <laughs> I, I, I agree. Um, um, hopefully, if we get a, an actual injection, you know, uh, next year, then it'll all go disappear. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but, so you're not, you're not too worried about your own career for the future. I mean, what have you got, have you got plans? You well, about? it's a funny one, isn't it? Because, you know, Netflix, the streamers were already dominating to a certain extent. And you wonder, is this like the final nail in the coffin? And do, <laughs> is this where they really take off? Because, you know, Netflix stock prices have went up to the biggest oil. Oh, just Disney from that somewhere. Yeah, it's, so, um, it's, it's online. Platform. Netflix is as valuable as oil now, which I think is just yeah. amazing, you know. <laughs> so is this the thing where, yeah, I, Netflix take even more of a mm. stranglehold on the whole thing and, you know, the upshot is Netflix have all this money right now and can't make anything, but eventually a green light will go and they'll have, you know, a year's worth of backlog of budget and ideas to just put into production, you know, yeah. already before, um, you know, this happened. People were saying this was like this. We're living in a golden age of telly now, and you know, seasoned, you know, people who've been in the industry much longer than me were always saying to me, like, God, this is. I've never been busier. Yeah. You know, it doesn't stop. It's back to back. The budgets are massive. Mm. Um. So hopefully, you know, it will it, be a continuation of that when the green light goes. I mean, it is. I mean, on a sort of British scale, the industry has gone absolutely mad. I mean, yeah. Uh, as I was talking to you, we're in our Green Lane campus for people at home type thing, but we couldn't get to Hartley Hall. But um, at Hartley Hall, was um, explaining to you about converting our bus sheds into the sound stages, and we've had Pinewood Studios come up and visit in. Yeah. And there's this massive need for TV, especially yeah. because the Americans have come to London essentially yeah, and yeah, taken yeah. over. So that's really exciting. I'm just thinking of my students, like, you know, to hear it from you. <laughs> you but our coronavirus, do you, do you think that will continue? I think you, 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 it's never been better. Mm. Coronavirus aside, working TV now, it's never been better, I think. And for me, like, well, certainly when I was like here, like, it was all about, I want to do a feature film, that's my thing. I, I, want, to that, yeah. I want to be an auteur, I want to be <laughs> Shane Meadows, I want to be Scorsese. And I think I still do, but now I think you can totally do that. In, t in the TV world. Yeah. Like for me, yeah, that's I mean, a big change from 10 to 15 years oh, ago. Oh, it's completely. It's, it's, it's like TV is now similar almost, isn't it? So. No, completely. And for me, it's just so much more accessible in a good way. Like when I think of people I've known who've made a low budget British feature film and I haven't seen it because it's a big effort, isn't it? You've got to pay 15 quid, you go out, and you know, once you're in there, you can't leave. <laughs> and I don't know, it's like, if I made my own Netflix series now that I wrote, I can't think of anything better than that. Because if I do, you know, I'm not having to force my friends and family to take <laughs> a night off and get the babysitter in to, you know, watch me, you know, indulge myself. You know, it's like now that if everyone's got Netflix, they can tune in and watch it. If they don't like it, they can turn it off. And just the, the global appeal, like I did the show Net, um, Chewing Gum, which is tiny little E4 show, tiny little E4 mm -hmm. show. At the time, it was just a bit of an underdog show that I did, and and that became huge in America and big in Brazil, and also, <laughs> and it's all Netflix, you know. Mm. It's arguably 
it's face force aside, the more successful show I've done. Right, yeah. But, you know, 10 years ago, that would have just been a little E4 show, yeah. no more than that. Whereas now, because of Netflix, buying stuff up, it's got a huge following in America. She's, Michaela Cole's now doing a show for HBO Max, which is another streaming service. But it's all because it's, you know, got globalised in this way because of Netflix. And, and so do you make money out of that then? Uh, no. So you have got the rights to <laughs> I wish, I wish I get these comedy checks through the mail for certain things I do yeah, yeah. from streaming, um, for money from streaming and stuff, but it's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Michaela Cole and certain other people will be doing amazing from like that type of stuff. But yeah, yeah. but uh, to do well out of that, you've got like Greg Daniels, he did Space Force. He did um, The American Office, which ran for how many seasons? Yeah and how many episodes and streams and how many countries and you know his checks that he gets daily from the job he did 10 years ago will be amazing yeah, I suppose it's <laughs> on to some of those rights isn't it exactly yeah, I think that's right. why I'm really trying to go for the writing thing my, my next big thing my other goal now is to write and direct a thing in its entirety because I think that's where the real kudos in TV I was going to say what would be your your piece de resistance oh, that would be the only and it, it wouldn't be the film thing anymore for me it, whether that's a sad thing in the industry or what, but for me now, to write and direct six episodes, even if it was, if it was for BBC Three or whatever, that'd be ultimate for me. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I think on that note, I don't think we have any other questions come through. So, Great stuff. Um, I think thank you very much, Tom. That's been great, brilliant. Yeah. Really good. Really, I think we've covered all the areas. You've got four more questions. Have we? Uh -huh. Sorry, hang on, guys. We just we apparently got more questions. Ah, uh, that was loads. Yeah. I was thinking that's amazing. We only got two questions, right? Sorry, Tom. You're not quite finished. Yeah, yeah. Totally. I should flick through, and if we haven't covered them, uh, uh, Tom, one of my students, uh, what have you been doing during lockdown to remain creative? Uh, I've been like shooting little short films with my brother, like with me starring in them because we can't get actors in. Um, like just to keep the juices flowing, and then Famalam we've knocked up a couple of like corona based sketches we could get away with doing oh, right, cool. um and then i've been trying to write my own stuff um series ideas i've had for a while and now this is finally the opportunity to work on but yeah i've been terrible i just find it so depressing at the moment <laughs> that i haven't actually done that well in that department but hopefully now acclimatized lockdown in the next few months i'll actually be able to um actually get down to write some stuff. I did write a treatment for the BBC um, and I got a call from one of the commissioners yesterday and he basically said he really liked it, um, gave me some little notes on it, but he's going to sort of push that forwards. So something like that I oh, needed cool. to give me a little boost yeah, in yeah. actually sitting down and writing a screenplay. Um, yeah, like at first I felt really bad. So I was like, God, I've got all this time on my hands, but I'm not making anything, I'm not writing anything. But we are in like an unprecedented, super depressing, unpredictable pandemic. So I don't think it's, you don't have to feel that bad for not going out and writing your yeah. screenplay right now, you know. And um, you've, a lot of these questions you kind of covered, um, but this is quite a good one, I think, for some of the students and especially sort of now. So you seem a very confident and great communicator, very important for a, um, a director. What communication advice do you have for quieter students who might have anxiety issues and want to become a director? Yeah, I think I, I, I've always, I, I don't know, I, I didn't think I appeared confident at all <laughs> because I find myself constantly like um, trying to sound more articulate than I am. Well, certainly early on, I was always trying to sound more articulate and intelligent <laughs> than I am. You know what I mean? All the time. And like, especially working with certain actors, I'd, if I had something to say to them, I'd go about it in the most roundabout way. And I'd go up and like, if you tr really try, not really nuanced and, you know, really try and draw the note out. <laughs> yeah. Whereas now, and especially with certain actors that I'm super comfortable with, it's just super simple to the point direction is actually what actors want. You it's know, just want to be Yeah, is that how do you, a bit more angry, a bit more sad, quicker, <laughs> shorter, <laughs> yeah. don't worry so much. Like, and then like, in, in nuanced notes, yeah, like I've found like, don't, if you want to do a character, um, 
who, who's trying to hide his sadness, just like, oh, don't stop smiling. Try your best to not, not stop smiling. Stuff like that's good. Yeah, yeah. But again, it's like short, concise notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like what actors want. Especially when they've got that time frame of trying to get something shot quickly, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, I was just going to go. Right, um, I love the sci-fi genre, and I would love to hear uh, your influences when it came to directing Space Force. Did you take inspiration from real space programs and other films? There was, yeah, well, like, this is a big thing. It was Space Force, right? When I heard the pitch for it, I assumed, oh, it's set in space, right? It's like, it's, uh, what, what Space Force will be in 20 years? But actually, the joke with Space Force, for the most part, is even though it's this big, grandiose idea, it's Steve Carell struggling with the day-to-day -day mundanity of, like, dealing with that in the confines of today's science, today's technology, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like the joke is, oh, he's trying to say like, can we put a laser on this satellite? And it's like, <laughs> we haven't invented them yet. Yeah. That's the sort of gag about Space Force, really. Yeah. So yeah, we actually had a NASA guy, for wow. most of it, a genuine guy being in the space. Yeah. And I'd ask him the odd thing, and um, you know, we had to do a session where they were brainstorming um, at how to save the satellite. And you know you got to say them like so. What if you were brainstorming? What would what would NASA you do? Yeah. What would a now would a NASA guy brainstorm? What would it look yeah. like? But then what's funny is we started up doing the sort of factual stuff, what looked legit, mm. and then eventually Steve started to just play around and do some really funny outlandish stuff, and that's the stuff we've used in the edit. So we sort of had in there, but then we bent the rules slightly, you know, to go for what's funny. Um, right. So this is a good one. Um, uh, Describe your typical day as director, um, and the next one as well. How did you get offered the job in LA for Space Force? Yeah. Um, so a typical day, obviously the job. I'm sure you, all these students will know this, but three different sections: it's prep, shoot, edit. Prep can be quite loose, and it's the part I hate the most because it, because it's so loose. And there's just people talking to you, lots of meetings. I was going to remind you about your uh, drama and reconstruction grade that you got. Well, that was a terrible. Yeah, the paperwork, man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's what I, I, I hate the roughiness of it. And it's just like people coming and there's lots of answer, lots of questions to answer. And there's lots, lots of ideas floating about. And it's all quite wishy-washy. And you've got to almost think about the full thing. It's an entirety. So it's lots of meetings and you're talking about the full shoot that's about to come up and then obviously the worst part is right before you shoot you've got this super intensive week it always boils down to a week where you've got the tech recies right the tech recies i'm sure you know this your students will know this you you go with the full crew you go to the location by that point you've done all the prep which you obviously haven't but you have to describe to the full crew okay so i'm gonna have my main camera positions are here so we need to dress that we need to dress that i'm gonna put this thing here and anything fruity you want to discuss, you discuss there and then, right? And it's horrible. You've got to do the full shoot in like two days yeah. and everyone's knackered and you get the bus. That's horrible, right? But then you've got the shoot, which again is sort of horrible and super stressful, <laughs> but it's at least, if it's certainly if it's a job you're doing, you're doing because you love it, like fam or lamb. It's, it's throughout the day, you just get lots of little boosts, a really funny thing you do, a really sexy shot, and that keeps you going. And it's super stressful. And you know, still to this day, certain shoot days I'll get my little knots in my stomach and really stressed and I'll lose my rag a bit a couple of times but it's like a bit of a roller coaster at least and what I love about shooting instead of being really wishy-washy and big it always boils it down to no 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 right now we just need a shot there of that person doing that thing done and then we move on and what I love is at the end of a shoot day you have your sides and you just scrumple them up I've done it yeah I've done that done and now all we need to think about is tomorrow. Yeah, because my students need to evidence that. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. And then, then, then the edit is just a complete holiday. Really? It and couldn't be. Easy. How, how much do you get oh. involved with the edit? Oh, well, I'm there at, for the UK jobs. I'm there every day. You go in at 10, you leave at 6, you sit with the editor, you try and use the different different takes. You have to deal with notes. You get That's the big thing that you know I didn't see coming. You have lots of different voices. You have the producers. The commissioners, um, sometimes the writers, and they'll send in notes. And often you you you've done your pass and you think it's amazing, yeah. perfect. But then you get all these notes in and you have to change things and you get really knacky about it and you do it begrudgingly. And often you accept, oh yeah, well now it's better. But sometimes you never let go of the way you had it. So that's the one difficulty. But aside from that, the edit's just an amazing holiday. 
where I sit there and I think I cannot believe I'm getting paid for this. <laughs> cool. Right. So I can't get through all of these questions. I think um, one of them is quite a good one. Uh, what was the best thing about attending uh, CCAB slash Northern School of Art? It was just it, the practicality of it is what I loved. Like more so than other film courses, I had my eyes on and things. People I knew were at film courses. Stuff. We were just making stuff all the time, which is what I loved. We were constantly getting out. We had the time to hire the cat and do stuff in your own time. But then there was just lots of practical work to do. And it's stuff like, like harking back to family land now, I always remember Andy, one of the lecturers, one day came in and said, oh, I'm sick of you sat around, you should be out making films. And he put, I can't remember what he did, but we all had to put random words into a hat or something. And then we picked out two random words and then it was like, right, make a film about that. And the film that we, we made was like terrible, yeah. <laughs> but I just liked that process and like we, me and the like, friend who I made it with, we still reference that daft little short film we made yeah. to this day. Oh, that's brilliant. Go you on. know, and in terms of like, well, like Family Land, like the example I used, it's sort of not a million miles from that. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this set, I've got an hour to film something and think of something to do in that hour. Yeah. You know, it's all those same skills. And it's like, even at the Space Force level, and, you, and you've done all the prep in the world, and you've got Steve Carell there and John Malkovich, Ultimately, you have you always have to think on the spot and you always have to event just essentially edit it in your head. Get a shot here, right? I've got that shot now, I need to get this shot. It's all the same instinct. So like my I only really have three bits of advice to give that I think I'm qualified to give. And it's literally watch loads of stuff, right? And steal from it. Steal from as many <laughs> things as possible. Because if you steal from loads of things, it things it's not stealing. Um, and then make as much stuff as you can all the time. Just keep making stuff, keep making stuff. And then just get that stuff seen is the only three bits of advice I feel qualified to give. And I th almost feel like CCAD, we had loads of time to watch stuff. Um, and then we had loads of time to make stuff. And then we had the nice screenings where you get to hear an audience react to your thing. And I think that type of stuff is priceless. Yeah, that, that, uh, uh, you met, we, we were at Cineworld, weren't we? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we were doing new cinema, except for last year to get very small. Yeah, yeah. But, um, we, we, that, it's a real nice buzz for the students oh, to get the yeah. scene at the cinema. So yeah. we hopefully we'll be doing that again. Right, so I'm just quickly looking through. Oh, right, we'll finish on this one. Um, um, some of them, guys, I'm just for, for people at home, I'm just, I think Tom sort of covered them. But um, how do you deal with creative differences as a director? Yeah, it depends. Again, depends on the job, right? Because you do have them, especially in TV. I think it's it's a, it's a right-led medium TV. So as a director, you're undoubtedly going to get into sort of creative differences. And my method is very rarely to be headstrong about it and bullish, softly, softly, and try and find a way to sort of cover both angles. So say like Chewing Gum, for instance, Michaela Cole, super talented, super outspoken um, actress and writer. Um, there'd often be times where she wanted one way and then you just, if you wanted it a different way, you just, in a really subtle way, like, no, let's get both for the edit. Let's get both and then decide in the edit. Was, I can't tell you how many times I've said that. Yeah, let's try both, see what right. we I advise the students that if they've if they got, you know, a difficulty or a creative difference, film it both ways, you know, do it the actor's way or, or, or do it yeah, the way. Yeah, exactly, so, yeah. And then you've got both in the can, and then it could be that the actor's completely right and you're wrong. No, <laughs> completely. Um, but so yeah. that it's that softly, softly all the time. And then we'll even like, say for instance, right, with Steve Carell, um, I remember, because I was terrified like before, like what am I going to say to Steve Carell? Some, someone's asked that question actually. So. Ah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's like what, what, what am I possibly going to say to Steve Carell? But again, quite luckily, like early doors, quite a big scene, with quite dialogue heavy from Steve, and he was doing it a certain way, and it was good, mm. and there's nothing wrong with it at all, but I just thought it would be interesting to see in a different way. Basically, he had to be quite a big monologue, and I felt watching it, it looked a bit prepared, like he knew what yeah, he was saying. Yeah. And the, the, all the note was, was, Steve, do you want to do it again? But at first, almost be a bit taken aback. Mm. And then gradually find your footing. And then by the end of it, it's like you're on a bit of a roll. You heard that? Yeah, 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 I, mean, I did it. And I've actually got a picture of me giving that note to Steve, <laughs> right? And 
after he came up, after the take, he just came up and he was like, yeah, that was good. I like that. That was good. And it's just stuff like that. It's just like a mate's mind blown. You have to start like play cool. And like, all right, yeah, cheers. But really, I was like, oh my God, he's like my nose. <laughs> so like, even with like Steve Carell, or honestly, more often than not, actors want the notes and if a good actor won't mind yeah. trying it a different way, even if he's 100% committed to doing it his way, yeah, yeah. let him do let him do a couple of takes that way, yeah. but then come in and just like, yeah, we've got those in the bag, perfect, amazing. Um, now, to just try it a bit different, you know, is always the way, I think. Yeah, I agree with totally on that one. Um, right. Can I say one thing interesting oh, about Steve? Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like he's dead interesting in terms of performance, in terms of creativity and so Steve, right, so say the line was, um, we need to fix the satellite. He would literally do that line about 20 times. Just give it that, just that line. We need to fix the satellite. We need to fix the satellite. You think, he'd just do that, he'd leave you gaps. He'd leave you gaps so he, he knew you could get in in the edit. But even at Steve Carell's level, you know, the, the finished article you've seen on command or whatever it is, that's not the first take he did. Steve, more than any of I've worked with, literally is just trying it out like this, like that, like this, like this, da, 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 da. you know. And is he, is he where he's doing that to give you the just options? Just all the have? options that you want. He knows, yeah. he knows the best thing to do is to give options and yeah. try. So, you know, I've, I've always thought like if I was ever working with an actor again and I find it different, I'd, I'd plant that anecdote in, do you know what I mean? Even Steve Carell, gave me so many options, yeah. literally limitless for every line. You just try it up here, try it down there, try it like this. Because he knows that's the secret comedy, is comedy especially. Yeah, yeah. Try it out a million different ways, surprise yourself, surprise the crew, and you'll that's undoubtedly the takes you'll end, end up using more often than not. Cool. Right. I think you kind of covered, so we've, have you, we've spoken about American and UK production differences, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, cool. yeah. So, uh, uh, it would just be the money. Let me quickly tell you one more from, <laughs> from Space Force. Oh, okay. I know this is just the level of it is, especially with the Netflix money, it is it is like it's feature film money. Right? Yeah, yeah. So first day on set, um, when I'm just getting shown around the sets, there was a particular set, right, where it was like a meeting room for all the heads of staff. Um, and then there was a little offshoot of a corridor. So it looked like there was a corridor there, but there wasn't a corridor there in the set, right? And I knew from reading the script a lot that I had a nice walk and talk with Steve Carell and John Malkovich on their way to this meeting room, right? So my, literally I've been there 20 minutes my, and I said to the guys, oh, you know what, if this corridor was a bit longer and came to about here, um, I could do like really nice West Wing style walk and talk there. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh yeah, great. And they said it in such a way that I thought, all right, that's nothing. They're going to put some boards, nothing. Right, and it was so nice because usually with UK budgets and certainly not for the streaming services, you're just used to like constantly battling the budget and never being able to get exactly what you want, right? So that's the big difference because then a few days later, I went back to the set and the um, the corridor was there. A few days later, I was like, oh man, amazing, great. <laughs> Cheers, lads, nice one, wicked. <laughs> and then the assistant director just whispered in my ear, yeah, that cost $150,000. <laughs> I was like, oh god, really? But I never got told off and no one told me off for it, yeah, you know. Yeah. So that's the big difference really, is the scope and the scale and the things you can do. You still, you can't do everything, it's not 100% perfect, you do, and you don't get all the time in the yeah, world. Yeah. But certainly uh, with the streamers and working in the US, it's opened up this like almost feature film level of production for, for TV. It is, it's amazing, isn't it? Right, so we've come up to quarter past, and I think we definitely have to end it there. Yeah. I tried to answer, I've asked the questions from the students, but a lot of them you have answered anyway when we yeah, have yeah. chats and stuff. So I'm not ignoring the people I um, sort of mentioned. But other than that, thank you very much. It's been absolutely wonderful cheers, coming man. in, and so it's, it's a joy to see you doing so well. And, and, right, uh, cheers, and oh, thanks to you guys. Uh, yeah. Uh, you uh, oh, thank you. Um, uh, and I think we'll end it there. Thank you very much. Cheers, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> Is that?